Now I'd like to welcome Michael Abrash, Chief Scientist at Oculus. Thank you. Wow. I have to tell you, it's overwhelming for me to be here today and feel all the energy and excitement around virtual reality. Just a few years ago, all of this would have been totally inconceivable. And that excitement is richly deserved. VR opens up a whole new universe of possibilities. And once you've experienced it, it's obvious that it's going to change the world in a big way. And the truly amazing part is that we've barely started down the path toward what VR is capable of. Decades of innovation and new experiences lie before us. Today, I'm going to talk to you about what we at Oculus Research see as the core challenges of VR, the ones that are the keys to unlocking the future. And between that and the rest of Connect, I'm pretty sure that we'll all be on fire about VR by the time we leave. But then we're all going to go back to our normal lives. And that excitement will fade. So I'd like to tell you a little story. Back in 1992, I moved to Seattle to work at Microsoft on the first version of Windows NT. I'd never been at a large company or worked on a large project before, so I had a lot of adjustments to make. Not least, learning how things worked under NT's architect and manager, Dave Cutler, an industry legend with his own very clear way of doing things. One day, I was heading to a meeting when Dave started walking next to me to the same meeting. Now, you have to understand that Dave was brilliant, driven, and, to put it mildly, not given to wasting time on polite chit-chat. That was a good thing. NT would never have shipped without all three of those attributes. But I think it's accurate to say that Dave and I had never had a conversation that wasn't purely functional. We walked in silence for a little while. Then Dave suddenly turned to me and said, you know, these are the good old days. <laughs> I don't think I would have been more startled if David announced he was a Martian. I don't remember what I said, but I do remember what I thought. I don't think so. <laughs> NT was a pressure cooker back then, with a big part of the future of Microsoft riding on it. My days were a stressful blur, under intense time and quality pressure. And that sure didn't feel like the good old days to me. But you know what? Dave was right. When I think back on NT, what I remember are the teamwork, the accomplishments, and the camaraderie. And I think about how I helped to build the core of the operating system that hundreds of millions of people have used every day for the past 15 years. It was more than just time well spent. It was time to be treasured, a rare opportunity to really make a difference. My only regret today is that I didn't properly appreciate that opportunity at the time. So I urge you to take a moment now and then to remember how unbelievably fortunate we all are to have the opportunity to be VR pioneers. We're creating a whole new way for people to interact with technology, one which has the potential to redefine almost everything about the way that we work, play, and interact with each other. Opportunities like that come along once or twice in a lifetime at best, so make all you can out of this one. Having said that, we're all here to change the future, and the future of VR is incredibly promising. Imagine being able to feel and manipulate virtual objects. Imagine being able to bring real objects into the virtual world to create mixed reality. Imagine talking to someone and believing that their avatar was really them, right down to the way they smile and gesture, and then feeling the vibrations as they set their soda can down on the table. And imagine feeling like you've slipped on magic glasses that reveal another world that's as vivid and believable as this one. All of those experiences, and many more, have the potential to become real in the next five to 10 years. And as they do, we will all gain a new superpower, the ability to build our own personal and shared realities. My own dream is to jump into a personal workspace configured however I want, 10 giant monitors, or a huge hologram, or flaming letters in the sky, then be able with a click to switch to another workspace set up for something else maybe a room full of books open to where I last left them, or a half-completed model of a prototype, or an endless plane of virtual whiteboards covered with my notes. Coworkers could teleport in to look over my shoulder or sit and talk, and when I want to relax, friends could stop by to chat or play chess. Your dream is probably different. Maybe it's a sculpting studio, 
or an animation lab, or a game design space, or something else entirely. Whatever it is, VR has the potential to bring it to life. It would be amazingly cool to be able to do all that. But it's not going to happen on its own. Getting to the next level of VR is going to require coordinated advances in more than a dozen different technologies. Today, I'm going to map out the areas that we think are key to the future of VR, and then I'll talk a bit about how we're working to bring that future about. The future of VR will be built on three pillars. Driving the human perceptual system, sensing and reconstructing the local state of the real world, and interaction. I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of what they are, where they stand, and how they can get better. I'll only have time to skim across some of the high points, but that should be enough to give you a sense of the astonishing breadth and depth of the challenges involved in moving VR forward. If you saw my F8 talk, you won't be surprised that I put driving the human perceptual system at the top of the list. I'm not going to, going to discuss why in any depth today. Check out the F8 talk if you're curious. But I am going to show just one illusion as an introduction for the uninitiated and as a refresher for the rest of us. The video I'm about to play shows that we reconstruct the state of the world from whatever evidence we can gather, combined with lots of assumptions based on prior experience and millions of years of evolution. Now, to me, this looks like a double-peaked roof. Interestingly, the reflection looks like a single-peaked roof. Let's see what they look like as the view angle changes. Stranger and stranger. Now the roof is single-peaked, and the reflection is double-peaked. Here's what's going on. Now that we see the true shape of the roof, let's look at this illusion again. The guesses our visual system made about the roof line were not only perfectly reasonable, but were by far the most probable states of the world, given the available data. They just happened to be wrong because the highly likely assumptions the guesses were based on were wrong in this particular case. What's important here is that by understanding how your visual system infers the state of the world, we were able to make you see something that wasn't actually there, nicely demonstrating that the reality we experience is whatever the perceptual system and brain say it is. This leads directly to VR's unique power, the ability to drive the perceptual system to induce experiences that feel real. So the better we can drive the perceptual system, the better the VR experience. Ideally, that means driving the five traditional senses plus one more. If we could drive these six senses perfectly, then VR would be indistinguishable from the real world. Let's look at how close we are in each of these areas and how we might get closer. Let's start with taste. While it's not hard to imagine delivery systems for taste, it is hard to imagine ones that people would actually be willing to use. <laughs> also, virtual food requires proper haptics and aroma for chewing and swallowing, and there's no prospect of getting those right anytime soon. Finally, taste is much less generally useful than the other senses. So this is the one sense that I'm happy to leave to future VR researchers. <laughs> Smell has powerful memory and emotional associations, but it's surprisingly complicated. You'd think all it would take to produce convincing smells would be to release the correct odor molecules near the nose. But in fact, odors in the real world don't simply diffuse. They waft as long strings of molecules. And we're sensitive to that. So just releasing molecules near the nose wouldn't seem right. Also, there's no small palette of primary smells that can be combined to produce the full range of olfactory experience, like red, green, and blue can for color, so thousands of different molecules would be required. Finally, odor molecules tend to be persistent and sticky. So scent generators tend to end up smelling like a combination of all the smells they've ever emitted. So there's lots of potential for smell in VR, but it's going to take some serious research plus breakthrough delivery techniques to move it forward. Next, we come to the vestibular system, our built-in accelerometers and gyroscopes, which sense acceleration and change in orientation. 
The vestibular sense is essential to balance and our awareness of where we are in space. And it's particularly important for VR because conflict between our vestibular sense and what we see is a key cause of discomfort. In fact, people without functioning vestibular organs are generally immune to motion sickness. When you're in a first-person shooter in VR and you spin and accelerate down a hallway, visual vestibular conflict is why you suddenly feel dizzy and break out in a cold sweat, or at least why I do. No names, but annoyingly, some people are completely unaffected. So vestibular is high on the list of senses we'd like to drive well, but it's also at the top of the list of senses we don't know how to drive, because your vestibular organs are buried inside your skull. It's certainly possible to stimulate them by passing a current through them, but the effects of surface electrodes are very coarse. The only conceivable way right now to get fine control is to implant electrodes inside the skull, and I don't think we'd get 100% adoption on that even from hardcore gamers. I'm not happy leaving the vestibular sense to future VR research, but right now, there's no traction on the problem. When it comes to VR, hearing is my favorite sense, because it can have a huge impact on VR experiences, especially in conjunction with vision, and there's actually a clear path to doing it almost perfectly. Clear doesn't mean easy, though. There's a lot to figure out between here and there. There are three elements of audio simulation, synthesis, propagation, and spatialization. Synthesis is the creation of source sounds. Right now, this is done with pre-recorded waveforms played back as point sources, but ultimately it needs to be done by properly simulating the physical processes involved in the generation of sound, such as surface vibrations. This area is just starting to be studied, and it doing it right promises to be unbelievably computationally intensive. Next, we come to propagation, how sound moves around a space. I used to think that audio propagation would be simpler and less computationally demanding than graphics, since our visual sense is so much more acute than our hearing, but I was wrong for two reasons. Unlike light, sound waves of different frequencies diffract, reflect, and interfere very differently. Also unlike light, sound travels slowly enough for the delay to be perceptible. This means sound has to be simulated as a 3D time series across many frequency bands, which is much more expensive than generating a single instantaneous global solution per frame. As a result, audio propagation simulation is understood, but it's so computationally intensive that only approximations can be done in real time. And generalized hand handling of moving sources, listeners, and objects in real time is still an unsolved problem. Eventually, some of the sound waves bounce into the ear, and modeling this interaction is critical to giving the listener a sense of the direction of the incoming sound, that is, the sound's spatialization. Ideally, that would just be a part of propagation, but simulating the way sound waves bounce off your shoulders, move around your head, and interact with the folds of your ears is nowhere near practical right now. The solution is to use the head-related transfer function, or HRTF, which provides a good approximation of how sound waves arriving at a particular person's head are transformed into sound waves traveling down the ear canal to the eardrum. HRTFs have a few drawbacks, though. The biggest one is that they need to be customized on a per-person basis, which currently requires a machine like this one, an anechoic room to use it in, and a person willing to sit still for an hour while the machine measures their HRTF, arguably not ready for broad consumer acceptance. Also, HRTS have traditionally modeled sound as arriving from sources farther away than one meter. That has the advantage of being much more tractable because it removes distance from the calculations, but it also has the disadvantage of being wrong for anything within arm's reach. That means that if you want to work at a virtual workstation or play virtual ping pong, the technology doesn't yet exist to get the sound right. So we understand the equations that govern sound, but we're orders of magnitude short of being able to run a full simulation in real time even for a single room with a few moving sound sources and objects. Great VR audio is a matter of getting many more teraflops, developing a lot of novel techniques and clever approximations, and figuring out how to generate high-quality HRTFs quickly and inexpensively. 20 years from now, you'll be able to hear a virtual pin drop, and it will sound right. The interesting question is how close we'll be able to get in five years. Now we come to the sense that's most strongly associated with VR, vision. We understand pretty much everything about the physics of light. 
We know how to generate photons with lasers, LEDs, micro-LEDs, OLEDs and micro-OLEDs. And we know what those photons do when they pass through lenses, bounce down waveguides, hit diffraction gratings, bounce off micro-mirrors, and go through liquid crystals. And with the rift, we're at the point where we can put enough of the right photons in the right places on the retina to create virtual experiences. For all that, though, we don't yet know how to get VR headsets to produce anything close to real-world vision, and that's what it's going to take to turn them into magic glasses. In VR, photons get delivered to the eye by some combination of light source and optics. There are five main attributes that we want from photon delivery systems. A wide field of view, excellent image quality, variable depth of focus, high dynamic range, and all-day ergonomics. All of these areas need to improve to produce truly great VR, but improving one often works against one or more of the others. For example, if you want a very wide field of view, it's hard to keep image quality high. Similarly, image quality can interfere with, uh, with uh, dynamic range, and everything interferes with ergonomics. With existing technology, VR photon delivery is currently a matter of trading, choosing the best trade-off among these areas, and all currently known trade-offs are a long way from real-world vision. Here's where we are and where we want to be. Field of view is around 90 degrees, while we can see at least 220 degrees horizontally. Image quality is currently relatively low in several respects. It's fuzzy, and the image shifts subtly as the eye moves around. But the obvious deficit is in resolution, where we're at 10 to 15 pixels per degree, while 2020 vision requires up to 120 pixels per degree. For context, in conjunction with a 200 degree field of view, 2020 resolution would be 24K by 24K, something like 500 times as many pixels as we have right now. And most people have corrected vision that's better than 2020. Next, current VR headsets can only focus at one distance, and we need to support the full focal range of the human eye in order to properly replicate real-world vision. The range and precision of displayed light is currently orders of magnitude less than we're capable of seeing. And finally, current ergonomics are more suitable for casual use than for hours of use on a daily basis. Eventually, we need to get a form factor close to sunglasses with an ideal weight of under 25 grams. Ergonomics isn't only a function of photon delivery, of course. Sensing, computation, power, connectivity, and industrial design all contribute as well. However, as long as photons get delivered by cell phone panels viewed through single lenses, the form factor can't get a lot smaller than it is today. Similarly, the current system doesn't have a lot of headroom to increase field of view while maintaining image quality. That means that getting to the next level of VR is going to require a photon delivery system that doesn't exist yet based on either brand new technology or a novel combination of existing technologies. Unfortunately, I don't have time to dive into the many approaches that have the potential to improve photon delivery, ranging from animation and graphics all the way to nanotechnology. But it's worth noting that vision clearly has multiple deep and challenging research issues. And vision is just one of the ways to drive the perceptual system. And driving the perceptual system is just one of the three pillars of VR which should make it pretty clear why I think there's a lifetime's worth of interesting challenges still to be solved in VR. Finally, we come to haptics, by which I mean all the direct sensing that the body does, both touch and kinesthesis, internally and on the skin. Haptics is at the core of the way we interact with our surroundings, and without it, we'll never be fully embodied in the virtual world. It's obvious that what we want is the full range of sensations across our bodies, especially our hands, What's not obvious is how to do that in a general purpose consumer device. I'm pretty sure this isn't the answer. <laughs> as important as haptics potentially is for VR, it's embryonic right now. There's simply no existing technology or research that has the potential to produce haptic experiences on a par with the real world. So any solution will have to come from breakthrough research. The senses are only the gateway to perception. The reality we perceive is constructed deep in the perceptual system in the brain by integrating and analyzing multiple sensed inputs in light of our prior model of the world. If we could drive the senses exactly the way the real world does, then VR would be easy. But we can't. So we have to rely on perceptual psychology to explain how various sensing mechanisms work and how the sense data gets processed to produce a model of the world so we can find alternate ways to produce the desired experiences. Some of that is thoroughly understood. 
For example, the fall off in the eye's resolution away from the fovea is well known and could be leveraged by foveated rendering. That is, rendering only a small part of each frame at full resolution, then moving that around as the eye moves. But a lot of the perceptual system is still a mystery. For example, consider the following, which I hope works in this big room. Watch carefully to see whether the balls bounce or cross. How many of you thought the balls bounced? Raise your hand. How many of you thought they crossed? OK, now let's look at this one more time. Again, watch carefully to see if they cross or bounce. <laughs> Who thought they bounced this time? <laughs> Big difference. I was really worried about that one. <laughs> But why does hearing a sound in the middle of this animation change what you see? That's a great, great question to which no one knows the answer. And the fact that we don't understand something this simple should give you a sense of how much we have yet to learn about perceptual psychology and how much difference the right combination of stimuli at the right time can make. Also, of course, we need to figure out how to reduce and ideally eliminate motion sickness. And since we can't directly stimulate the vestibular system or exert accelerations on your body, it's up to perceptual psychology and neuroscience to figure out alternative ways to do that. There's much more to be said about perceptual psychology and about driving the senses in general, but while creating virtual experiences is at the core of VR, it's only part of the equation. Great VR also requires the ability to sense and reconstruct the real world. Right now, we can track the headset and controllers, and that's an excellent start, but you won't be fully present in VR until you can see your own hands and body. Also, as good as the Rift and Oculus Touch are, VR won't reach its full potential as a social environment until you can see other people's avatars and truly believe that they are people. Finally, you'll want to be able to pull re the real world into VR to create mixed reality so that you can move around freely and interact with real objects such as keyboards and coffee mugs. To do all that, we'll need to be able to track faces, eyes, hands, bodies, physical objects, and your surroundings and then reconstruct them in VR all in real time in a consumer-friendly package. That's a huge challenge for many reasons, including latency, compute, power, form factor, weight, sensor limitations, moving objects, and non-rigid objects. Excellent research is being done across the board in computer vision, including this work by Richard Newcomb, who recently joined us along with the rest of the Surreal Vision team. But none of the important areas are currently solved well enough for VR. And making all this work is going to require rethinking the entire sensing and reconstruction stack, both hardware and software, from the ground up. Nonetheless, the outlook is good. For example, the ability to reconstruct a room accurately enough for VR in real time doesn't yet exist. But consider this. This is an early real-time prototype from the Surreal Vision team, and it needs to get a whole lot better before the experience is as good as it needs to be. But imagine this happening automatically and seamlessly with proper texturing and lighting, and it's easy to see the enormous potential of pulling the real world into VR. Once we have the ability to drive the senses well enough to produce experiences that feel real, and we can track the real world well enough to bring ourselves and other people into it, we can think about how we want to interact with that virtual world. The feedback loop from vision to motor control to haptic sensation is one of the most powerful ways to create deeply convincing experiences. Oculus Touch is a huge step in that direction, but it's obvious that what we really want in the long run is for the hands to be able to act as the dexterous virtual manipulators that they are in the real world. That's incredibly hard, arguably harder than either driving the senses or reconstructing the real world for two reasons. The first problem is that there's no hope anytime soon of reproducing the haptics of the real world. There are several obstacles to this, but the showstopper is that there's no feasible way to fully reproduce real-world kinematics. Put another way, when you put your hand down on a virtual table, there's no known or prospective consumer technology that would keep your hand from going right through it. Bringing physical props into the, real, into the virtual world, mapping a real keyboard into VR, for example, can help. But if all we wanted was the real world, we wouldn't have bothered with VR in the first place. What we really want are virtual keyboards, as well as virtual levers, 
buttons, handles, and other tools and controls that work as well as their physical equivalents, along with the ability to manipulate a wide range of virtual objects. In order to make that happen, new haptic technology, primarily based on touch, and possibly combined with some localized kinesthetics, needs to be developed so the hands can sense and respond to virtual interactions. That will certainly be hard, but solving it will only get us to the second challenge, developing a whole new interaction language around that haptic technology. Imagine that it's 1970, and you've just invented the mouse, but still have to invent and implement the concept of a bitmapped windowing interface for the mouse to drive. That's where we'll be when we've developed good enough haptic technology. Figuring that out is going to take a lot of research and time, but I'm absolutely confident that the first haptic VR interface that really works will be world-changing magic on a par with the first mouse-based windowing systems. I wish I had more to tell you about interaction, but it's very early days. I've just laid out an enormous research space, one that covers all of human perception, half a dozen areas of sensing and reconstruction, and a whole new interaction model. Exploring that space will require world-class research in areas ranging from computational optics to material science to sensor technology and much more, along with equally strong engineering and programming. What's more, it will require a great deal of multidisciplinary work. This project, which we developed in collaboration with the University of Southern California, illustrates just how cross-disciplinary VR research is. Faces are particularly difficult to track in VR because the headset covers the top half of the face. Here's a first step we've taken towards solving that. In the video I'm about to play, note that you can see the user's expressions, including eyebrow raises and squints that are occurring under the headset. To capture the user's upper facial expressions, we developed a prototype with flexible sensors embedded in the foam, shown in yellow. Making that happen required expertise in computer vision, novel sensor design, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, perceptual psychology, machine learning, programming, and facial animation, all to address just one of VR's many tracking problems. We've spent the last year building a team that covers all of the areas on this slide and more, capable of diving into everything I've talked about today. Now it's on to the hard part exploring that vast, uncharted research space as quickly and effectively as possible. One of my favorite stories from back in the quake days is a good way to introduce how we think about that. Our story begins just after John Carmack had gotten Quake running in real time. At that point, it was possible to run around a level normally, but occasionally, Quake would turn into a slideshow. The problem was overdraw. Quake was rendering all the polygons in the view pyramid, and if you happened to be looking down the long axis of a level, there were just too many polygons being drawn. Most of them were occluded by nearer walls, but there was no fast way to tell which had to be drawn and which could safely be discarded. That was clearly unacceptable, so John started thinking about how to fix it. Over the course of a few weeks, John considered and eliminated a beam tree, a subdividing ray cast, purely planar geometry, a one-bit overdraw buffer, a span buffer, and portals. All had potential, but each turned out to have a fatal flaw. At that point, John switched to trying to extract visibility information directly from the BSP tree for the level, implementing a different approach every day for the next week. When I went home on Friday, he was gearing up for another try. When I came back in on Monday morning, John looked like he hadn't slept for two days. And in fact, he hadn't. Lying in bed, Sunday morning at 3.30 AM, he had a new idea and went right back to the office to try it out. He simply pre-calculated the set of all the other BSP nodes that were visible from each node and stored that visibility data in compressed form, and then, at runtime, drew only the polygons that were in nodes that were potentially visible from the current node. The result was fast and compact and solved the problem completely. John says pre-calculating the potentially visible set was a logical evolution of the approaches he had been considering that there was no moment when he said Eureka. And that's the point I want to make here. There's the popular myth of the brilliant flash of genius that solves a difficult problem effortlessly. But in truth, insight is generally the result of patience, hard work, and a willingness to experiment with lots of different ideas across the solution space until the right one falls into place. That philosophy is at the core of Oculus research. 
Our approach is to identify a broad range of new VR technologies that have the potential to be transformational and that could likely be ready to ship in four to 10 years if they pan out, then build prototypes to quickly try them out, running multiple experiments in parallel. The whole point is to be able to rapidly and intelligently explore the huge and largely unknown space of VR possibilities, build a knowledge and technology base that VR needs to be successful, and work with the product team to put the results into consumers' hands as soon as possible. Without a doubt, all that will take many, many years of research and development by the whole VR community. After all, Jim Clark built a geometry engine in 1979, and more than three decades later, 3D is still evolving. I have no doubt whatsoever that 36 years from now, VR will still be evolving in a big way, and that the seeds planted by Oculus and by all of us here today will still be bearing fruit. We've covered a lot of ground today, but I'd like to leave you with one more thought. When I was just starting to think of myself as a serious programmer, I was inspired by Stephen Levy's Hackers, which chronicled the birth of the computer, personal computer and the early video game industry. It was a book about technology, but what made it so inspiring were the stories of the people who made that technology happen. People like Lee Felsenstein, Steve Wozniak, John Harris, and Captain Crunch, to name just a few. Stories that made me think, it must have been so insanely cool to have been there and done that. Today, we, everyone in this room, are those people. One day, five, 10, 20 years from now, you'll be reading a history of VR. And when you get to the part about Oculus Connect, you'll think, hey, I was there. And you'll remember with incredible clarity what a remarkable and exciting time this was. And you'll be right. You may not realize it yet, but believe me, these are the good old days. Let's make the most of them as we build the future of VR together. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this morning's event live from the Dolby Theater at Hollywood and Highlands.